I'm all stumbly today. <clears throat> My fever broke just as I came down here, so I'm nice and sweaty, too. <laughs> um, my talk today is an OPLO. Uh, in the time I have available, I thought I would focus on sort of the things that make OPLO surgeries go wrong, which is to say um, poor decision making that leads to poor outcomes, or even when a case has been well considered by an otherwise careful surgeon and a good outcome is not achieved. Am I not pointing this at the right thing? Yeah. Yes. Um, one of the first things that I see, typically by generalists or people that don't see much OPLL, is they'll see a myelopathic patient with an MRI like this one, and they'll see what they see to be a, a disc herniation at the C45 level, and they'll take the patient immediately to surgery. Um, often I get called on those patients when they're having difficulty during surgery and you get a dural leak or some other problem. Um, I would urge caution. Uh, typically a large disc herniation can elevate the PLL, typically will not cause the kind of thickening that's seen in the PLL here. Most critically, as you evaluate a patient like this, you shouldn't see this degree of stenosis at the mid-vertebral body level. And I think it's very helpful in these patients to get plain radiographs, both look at their alignment and to look at the bony architecture. If you look closely, the increased AP diameter of the vertebral body is reflective of the OPLL itself. A CAT scan can be very helpful, or CAT scan myelogram, in better detailing the extent of OPLL and planning a reconstruction accordingly. Um, another issue that we see, in the U.S. at least, is that frequently OPLL features will be seen in conjunction with the more standard features of spondylotic myelopathy, problems like degenerative anterolisthesis and kyphosis from disc collapse, and these in combination can complicate typical treatment options uh, like laminoplasty. So here you see a patient that had a, real, a slightly uh, uh, neutral, slightly kyphotic spine, uh, slip at the uh, C34 level that wasn't particularly big. They went through a laminoplasty. Over a couple of years, the slip and the kyphosis both progressed, and you see uh, worsening myelopathy from stretching of the cord across the, um, the kyphotic deformity, and you see the uh, snake eyes pattern of uh, cord signal change on the axial. So standing flexion extension x-rays can be a very helpful way of determining whether the patient can uh, reach lordosis through extension and where there is or isn't instability or fixed angulation of the spine. When we classify OPLL during workup, we can do it by extent and shape and so on. I think all these individually in combination are helpful. We typically think of the um, Japanese health ministry classification here, which does point out some of the classic features of OPLL. One is that you can see long, continuous bars of ossified posterior longitudinal ligament. And another is, even when it's segmental, there's quite a bit of retrovertebral disease as opposed to disc-level disease, so very different from spondylotic myelopathy in that sense. The shape is also important. Um, often you'll see these long plateaus. Um, while those can be impressive in terms of their length, we know that the sharper the onset of cord compression, uh, the more likely the neurologic symptoms are to worsen. And so these hill beak shaped lesions, if they're more hill shaped, they tend to do better than the more beak shaped ones. And then these circumscribed hill shaped lesions tend to be the hardest to treat based mainly on their size. We want to know what portion of the canal is that OPLL fragment consuming. And then as we put that information together, uh, ultimately a nearly level-by-level -level analysis is helpful uh, to direct our management. Non-operative management is rarely a good option in patients with uh, any significant myelopathy. But the surgical options vary quite a bit in terms of the size of surgery, its surgical goals, and the morbidity of that surgery. Uh, on the U.S. in-training exams and board exams, uh, the common question about treatment options for OPLL is laminoplasty. That's usually the answer, and often that's a very reasonable answer, and it relies on posterior drift of the cord, and it's a great option for multi-level disease with the proper alignment. 
but how much core drift can you expect? Um, in some studies, you see up to three millimeters, but often less than two millimeters of drift, and that uh, core drift will decrease as you lose lordosis. It also decreases as you go cranial and caudal from the apex of cervical uh, lordosis. So how do you assess that alignment in terms of trying to predict that decompression? Well, um, a number of different angulations can be used. We know about sagittal vertical axis and C7 slope and different factors for cervical sagittal balance. The Cobb angle can be helpful, but a lot of these patients will have uh, a, a non-homogeneous pattern of uh, lordosis with straightening of their lower cervical spine and then hyperlordosis cranially. Uh, this is Ishihara's index on the right, which takes a little longer to calculate, but can give you a clearer sense of the degree of lordosis you're dealing with. More elegant than that is the K-line. The K-line is a line drawn from the center of C2 to the center of C7. And if that line, if the opiol fragment is entirely in front of that line, it's considered to be K-line positive. And if it passes behind that line, then it's K-line negative. And we know from the studies done that uh, the K patients that are K-line positive tend to do quite well with posterior approaches such as laminoplasty. Patients who are K-line negative tend to have higher rates of needing subsequent anterior surgeries or poor uh, JOA recovery scores. Initially, K-lines were measured on plain films. Later, CT and other data was used more often. It is important to recognize that uh, the modality can affect the results up to 10% of the time. Um, Taniyama and others used MRI data to create the modified K-line. And here you draw a line from the center of the cord at C2 to the center of the cord at C7. And you measure the distance between the anterior neurocompressive pathology and that line. And ultimately, <clears throat> if the pathology is less than four millimeters from that line, then the rate of recovery is worse with a posterior only approach. This is obviously more involved than a typical K-line, but it does have the advantage of being useful in patients with spondylotic myelopathy on top of just OPLL. And again, we see a number of patients that have some of both. Um, so going back to laminoplasty for a second, uh, obviously laminoplasty was developed to avoid some of the complications of, uh, post, of laminectomy over multiple levels, including post-laminectomy kyphosis. Now, we know there's also some issues with multi-level anterior surgeries that we'll go over, but even with the ready availability of lateral mass screws, uh, laminoplasty still has, is still a workhorse option in patients with the proper alignment because of the impact, the less detrimental impact on range of motion, the savings in terms of implant costs, adjacent segment problems, and so on. There are a number of variants of uh, the laminoplasty described in the literature. The first one was the Oyama Z-plasty, which is a fairly complex osteoplastic technique wherein the laminae were thin, drilled, and cut in a Z pattern, then spread open and wired together. That was a very complex procedure, which in the US is largely given away to the open door or here by Ashi uh, laminoplasty with a trough cut on one side and a hinge on the other. Developed around the same time, and, but less popular, at least in the U.S., is the French door laminoplasty, uh, where a gilet saw or a thread wire saw is used to cut through the spinous processes, and there, too, hinges are cut at the junction of the lateral mass and the, uh, and the lamina, and then a laminar spreader is used to pop the spinous processes open. Initially, uh, the hinges were just opened and left that way, over time, grafts and even plating devices were um, added. The advantage of the French door laminoplasty is that you get a symmetrical expansion of the canal and you're avoiding epidural veins seen laterally in the gutters. The disadvantages are that it's very hard to do a foraminotomy in this setting. It has to be done before the hinges are open and excessive foraminotomy may cause the hinge to fail. Fixation options have obviously been added to the open door laminoplasty as well. Initially, these two were just left open, uh, but when cases of hinge closure uh, and, uh, and laminoplasty window fractures occurred, 
uh, various fixation options were added, beginning with just suturing them down, followed by suture anchor placement, followed by use of bone, including the bone from the spinous process itself, followed by what's seen most frequently today, which is plating. I think a critical aspect of laminoplasty or any posterior cervical surgery in these patients um, uh, lies in the good hemostasis and then a meticulous closure. Uh, at the approach, avoiding detaching uh, the musculature from C2 and C7 is critical, but if you can't avoid that based on the levels affected, then a careful independent reattachment, for example, the suboccipital triangle muscles is important. You can close several fascial layers in the neck from the muscular fascia to the deep cervical fascia to the ligament nuca, and a good solid closure here will prevent fascial dehiscence problems and some of the sagittal balance problems that people can get with laminoplasty. How about anterior approaches? We know that the pathology is anterior to the cord and many other areas we, that would take us right to the front of the spine. Unfortunately, a simple ACDF is rarely a good option since, by definition, the OPLL passes beyond the disc space. So typically, corpectomy procedures are recommended, but we know that multi-level corpectomies have significant mechanical disadvantages and are also technically quite challenging to perform. Ideally, if, uh, if you can do a two single-level corpectomy procedure, that's mechanically much better than one long three-level corpectomy, even if it's a relatively small segment that's remaining in the middle. A typical approach uh, to corpectomy can be undertaken, um, and then as you get back to the uh, posterior cortex and begin to thin it, here's where the problem comes in. Unlike other cases of you know, bone spur related uh, compression of the canal, uh, the severity of the OPLL may make the millimeter or so depth of the foot plate uh, damaging to the cord, but even finding a good plane between the plate, uh, between the uh, OPLL and the dura can be a problem. Initially, it was commonly, the approach was commonly described as this inside-out approach where you gradually widen the approach and then you find an area of uh, normal uh, dura and then work out from there until the decompression was achieved. And that's reasonable, but we know there are very high uh, rates of durotomy associated with that. Ideally, once you find that normal, you can start peeling away and working from that normal. But as, uh, especially as you see, what you see here with this double layer sign, ossification of the dura itself is often incorporated in these OPLL cases. And so there may not be a truly normal junction there. Instead, a relatively wider corpectomy approach is espoused where you look closely at the pattern level by level of the uh, OPLL and devise a corpectomy accordingly. Often, as you see in the CAT scan in the middle, the lesion will be biased a bit to the right or to the left. And you can widen your approach. Uh, sometimes that requires taking out a good part of the oncovertebral joint and maybe even some of the longest coli if it's getting in your way. Uh, I like to figure out before I do my corpectomies exactly where I am and line it up with where the um, OPLL fragment is on the CT scan. These little markers can help verify that alignment, although intraoperative navigation is very helpful for that as well. And then using this wider outside-in approach, find normal tissue as best you can above, below, and to the left and to the right of the OPLL. And once you've uh, found those boundaries, you can begin to lift the thinned OPLL away from the cord. And if you find that there is an area of dural adhesion or ossification of the dura, since it's now completely detached from everything around it, you can leave it as sort of a micro-floating technique. It's not, no longer going to cause significant cord compression. This uh, procedure, unfortunately, I don't have much experience with from Shanghai is an uh, anterior controllable anti-displacement fusion. Uh, here, a third of the vertebral body is cut, uh, and then osteotomies are performed on the left and the right, and then the whole block of, of vertebra is pulled forward away with the OPLL away from the cord, and you can see that from a sagittal view here. Here's their clinical example. It's a beautiful case. It's something I have to try. 
And to your poster, your techniques, I know I'm running short on time here. I, I would say that these are used, unfortunately, more frequently than I'd like, typically in the context of multi-level stenosis where uh, there's uh, fixed kyphosis. Now, if you can get the patient into a uh, lower doses on extension, that's a good case for a laminectomy infusion, not necessarily a front back. But in patients with fixed kyphosis, uh, going to the front, releasing the uh, kyphosis, and then going to the back and decompressing and fusing is an option. In the most severely stenotic patients, I'll typically go from the back, give the cord some room. If it's a three, four millimeter canal, decompress them from the back provide some initial stability, go to the front, complete the corpectomy at those worst levels, and then go back to the back and lock it down back into the lordosis. Thank you.